Thank you, and uh, well done on this uh, wonderful report. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to be able to come and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing on the oldest of the national birth cohort studies, particularly as it's the uh, week of the MRC centenary, and the MRC has been funding this study for over half of those hundred years, for 51 years so far. So, and just to uh, let you know, if those of you who don't, it's a, a nationally representative sample of 5,500 men and women all born in a, in a week in March 1946 uh, and followed up since then. And the study's been really important in terms of uh, always asking questions of relevance to science and policy and investigating how social and biomedical factors interact to affect initially pregnancy and childbirth, then child health and development and educational progress and life chances. But in the last uh, years, we have been looking particularly at adult health and ageing, and of course all these earlier outcomes also affect what's happening in later life. So the key message on using the data up to 53 was that childhood really matters for adult health uh, along lots of different social and biological pathways, and that was the message on the 65th birthday you see here and in the Nature article uh, that we stressed since then, we've been really getting together uh, more sophisticated measures of ageing so that we can um, uh, take this uh, on much further. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about healthy ageing today, which is a growing area of research because there's great interest in uh, both scientific and political interest in how we are going to increase the proportion of healthy uh, people with healthy ageing. But we actually have, there's little consensus of what, it's me what it means. Uh, we don't know how much it is affected by factors across life, and uh, we're working out how best to intervene. And many of these questions are being addressed in a book that will be coming out later this year by OUP called A Life Course Approach to Healthy Aging. So uh, we've defined it in, in, in terms of both healthy biological aging and in terms of well-being. Well-being, of course, matters very much to the older people themselves. But I'm going to concentrate today on two aspects, uh, the delay or onset of clinical disorders or chronic diseases and optimal functioning for the maximal period of time. But I would like to say that 15% of the cohort had already died by the time of 65 and the importance of uh, factors right across life we know categorically affect their chances of whether they even had the uh, chance of having healthy ageing. So a paper that came out last year, we identified uh, 15 common clinical disorders by, what, by which we meant that a GP would be needed at least for uh, <coughs> medical supervision, if not for uh, treatment, uh, and there was consensus on that. And these are those, they're shown on the left-hand side here. And cardiovascular disease covers a number of things affecting already one in ten of the, of the cohort. And on the right, uh, we see uh, our measures of functional ageing. And what I've coloured them in different colours, so the red means there's very strong evidence that factors, social and biological factors across the life course affect these outcomes. Uh, the purple, where there's some evidence, but we're, that, that's growing. And there are a few things where uh, it hasn't really been studied and so as yet remains unknown. So what did we find? Well, first of all, as people approached retirement at 60 to 64 years, on average they had two of those clinical disorders. There were only one in three without a severe disorder and only one in six without a severe or moderate disorder. And these were not, these were, these were bars that were set relatively high. And those disorders, the distribution was strongly related to both their self-reported health and to that, those measures of functional ageing. What was particularly interesting, we found a cluster of one in five individuals with a high probability of cardiometabolic disorders, as illustrated. And that, that group were particularly, uh, we had assessed their health uh, in detail at age 36, and they were twice as likely to have been in poor health when they were 36 years old. I was going to take just a couple of examples to show you how, um, how each of these conditions has a kind of life course story. Some of the new ones we've been looking at, one on chronic, chronic kidney disease, um, where you can see in the slide here where um, Richard Silverwood has created childhood overweight latent profiles. Uh, there, weren't, well, there wasn't that much overweight in this cohort. Of course, there's a lot more in later cohorts. But those relative to those who were never overweight in childhood, those who were always in the overweight class, who had a, who had a pubertal onset overweight, were associated with several of our measures of, kidney, of poor kidney function. And we've also been able to show that childhood weight gain was also a risk for hypothyroidism and thyroid autoimmunity uh, in later life as well. Uh, of course, not that we mustn't forget the adult uh, factors and adult overweight, but 
particularly before 40 years, was a very strong risk factor for chronic disease, uh, chronic kidney disease. And that graph shows you just how important it is to try and prevent uh, overweight uh, early in adult life uh, because once you become overweight, very few people lose it and it predicts your trajectory right up until 60 to 64. Similarly, we have looked at clusters, profiles of blood pressure change, and the people at the top here, that group, who have got an accelerated increase, they not only we can relate that to their lower birth weight, their shorter height, their higher BMI in earlier adult life, and their poorer social circumstances in childhood, we are also just uh, submitted a paper which shows how that group uh, also have um, uh, adverse cardiac function and structure at 60 to 64 when we did the imaging. Just a couple of uh, uh, last few slides on something else, on strength and physical performance. We do these very simple assessments like grip strength, walking speed, and chair rise time, which we've already shown in the systematic review as highly related to uh, subsequent mortality, but also subsequent morbidity. And we'd already shown at 53 years that these, uh, if we take strength and physical performance, that these a whole range of factors, which I'm showing you on the slide, from birth weight and infant motor development right through to uh, a- a- adult uh, behavioural factors, d- d- does affect um, these, these measures um, quite strongly. And in fact, midlife cognitive function also shares many of these risk factors. So we're interested now as are these, these factors associated with function at 60 to 64 years and the change um, from midlife. And just to show you one, uh, the outcome of one paper that's impressed with the American Journal of Public Health, uh, which shows that compares the top and the bottom of the social class distribution here in childhood, but we also looked at it in adult life. And across those nine functional measures uh, of ageing that I mentioned earlier, like chair rise time and grip strength and verbal memory, you can see that uh, those at the bottom of the um, uh, social class distribution had between a 6 and 13% difference in their function, uh, poorer function than those at the top. And, of course, many of these cluster together, and if you actually make a summary score, the difference is more like 66%. So it's very clear that the health legacy of social inequalities in childhood persists right up to retirement. And the pathways are very complex uh, and we don't have time to explore. So very lastly, we're able to strengthen the evidence from the 1946 cohort by working with other cohorts to do systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And this just shows one that we did uh, for chair rise time by socioeconomic circumstances, again showing that it's not just in our study but across the study that poor socioeconomic circumstances in childhood really matter for adult health and function. And so this cross cohort research will really maximise the scientific value both of the 46 cohort and the other cohorts and I just show you here a variety of consortia that we are involved in uh, that uh, do cross-cohort work to supplement the in-depth work on the 46 uh, and, and other cohorts. And a new one on the block is, of course, closer that's been funded by the MRC and ESRC uh, to maximise the value and impact of the longitudinal studies. So my last slide, what have we learned so far about ageing baby boomers? That most people with, will age with clinical disorders. So, in fact, we need to understand how to delay onset, how to prevent the functional consequences, and how to support active ageing and well-being despite those clinical disorders. And we need to be focusing, I think, on optimal functioning for the maximal period of time. And that means both maximising the reserve built up during growth and development, but also we can alter uh, the onset and rate of functional decline. But we need evidence-based life course policies to increase the chance of healthy ageing and to decrease the social inequalities that I've shown you. We need to intervene to tackle obesity and to increase physical activity. The slide shows the percentage of inactivity uh, from 36 to 64 in our cohort increasing uh, rapidly. And uh, our job is to do another home visit uh, very soon, and we'll be doing more clinical studies and omics studies, particularly on neuroimaging, so we can really study cognitive decline and the risk of Alzheimer's. Thank you very much.